Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world on yet another nice sunny summer day. It is the last day of July, and you'll see that the grass is starting to turn a little bit yellow here and there, and that means that autumn is coming eventually. It just means it's kind of hot, so the grass gets all dried out. But I wanted to show you that, as promised, I did go and fill out the rest of our skeps. I went and ransacked the rest of this lake here, although I think there's still some cattail up in here that we could harvest. But we don't need it at the moment. We probably won't need it for a little while. So I am happy to let the cattails nearby regrow, and we'll harvest them later. Because when you do harvest a skep, you'll get about half the cattails, or eight-ish, that you put into it. So we won't have to harvest quite as many from the wild. Now I've just come back from a harvesting trip where I was refilling, here we go, our stash of blue clay for a couple reasons. But while I was out, I ran across something that I wanted to show you, and I figured we should go and explore it together. I was, well, you'll see, there's a hole near the blue clay that I was digging around in, and I heard some growls, and I went down to investigate. Probably not my best idea ever, but I survived, so yeah, it's fine. Totally fine. I'm going to make us some more food, and then we'll go. Okay, food gotten, and we're going to head out, and it's just up here. It's very close by. I did have to fight off a deep drifter that came to the surface, but they're not much more difficult than the surface drifters. They take four hits with a good throw from the spear in order to kill, but yes, I was getting the clay from here, and I got a... Well, I heard a bunch of growls, and I went down to investigate, and sure enough, right down here was this. This ruin full of goodies. Absolute chock full of goodies. We have crates, we have, we have ore vessels, forage vessels, a tool vessel, collapsed chest. Oh, with a bucket. Oh, man. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, that's right. They also have aged logs in the ceiling. Ruins are the only source of aged logs in the game, so if it's something you want, then you're going to have to keep an eye out for these larger ruins. But let's see what else is in here. We have another. What is this? A hummingbird mask and a hunter shirt and some lines. Oh, how interesting. How interesting. Well, let's go ahead and we're going to break all of these vessels here and we'll see what we get. We got forage. We got some grass. We got some grass. All right. That's exciting. Oh my goodness. That is, that is almost game breaking except for what else is on this schedule for today. So we'll hang on to that. The bucket would be interesting to find early on because buckets are something you can only make once you have a saw, at least a copper saw. And that means getting into the Copper Age, and on top of that, specifically, making an anvil. We have ore, we have lead, and chromite, okay. We have some more copper bits. We have some black coal. Very nice. More forage, we have some fire clay and some bamboo. We have more grass and some granite stones. We have two more pieces of copper. That was exciting for that war vessel. And then we have this stuff. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, man. We already have a shirt, right? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put our basket down here. Which I don't have on me, apparently. Okay. Well, never mind. I'm not going to put the basket on. We'll just uh, suffer, I guess. But I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pick up these crates. And there's a reason. Is that, one, while these are usable as storage items, there are some vendors who will buy them from you for a pretty hefty sum. And on top of that, they often hide other things back here. We have more lime. That's not too shabby. We'll collect these together into one. All right. And we have some junk metal. You are more metal scraps. Okay. I'm going to leave the spider web here. It is nice for decoration, but it is just clutter at this point. 
And I think I'll take the hummingbird mask. Where do you go? <laughs> oh, that's funny looking. I'll wear it for now. <laughs> I'm going to surprise myself with it later. <laughs> I just know I will. And I think lastly, I'm going to take this bony soil. This is some nice stuff for panning. We could also pick up this aged wooden chair and this table, but I'm not super concerned about them at the moment. They're kind of mostly interesting more than anything. And you're empty, and you just have some rye seeds. All right. Well, this was a great find. And you know what? I'll take the ladders, too. Well, that was cool. I'm going to take this all home, and I'll tuck it away for later perusal and use. And then we'll get on to the main focus of today's episode after one more small chore and explanation. Correction. That's going to happen after we talk to this guy because I saw earlier that he wanted to pay three gears each for up to four closed aged crates. And we have ten of them. So, we got twelve gears right there. Is that nice, or is that nice? He'll also buy a skep from us, which is kind of not a bad source. I mean, it's a small amount of gears, but they're all renewable except for the clay, I guess. But clay is so easy to come by. So we'll stop back in in a few days and see what else he's looking to buy. All right, folks, we are back. And as you can see, we've put things away and gotten some things out. And we've put the bucket on the floor here because they are ground storable. You can just crouch and right-click and place the bucket. Be careful if you shift right-click and place it because you will dump the bucket's contents. And that can be <laughs> annoying if not disastrous sometimes. But I noticed that all of our crops here are finally ready for harvest. The row along here took actually an extra half a day. So I'm thinking the roof actually does affect the sunlight they get a little bit. So that's a bummer, but whatever. So we have some mature rye, some mature spelt, and some mature flax. And the rye is a little bit sunburned, but that's okay. We don't need a ton of grain. And you'll see we already get 18 grain out of two harvests, or two crops. So yeah, we're not going to be suffering for grain anytime soon. But what I wanted to touch on here is that we need to now rotate our crops. So we've drained the nitrogen from... This soil here, oh, this is almost back to full. Actually, it is back to full already. We've drained the potassium from this soil. And we've drained the phosphorus from this soil. You can see this is recovering, but it's only up to about 35%. So we're going to basically swap all of these and move them down one row, essentially. And so after we pick all these things up, we're going to do that. And you will see that you will get a really nice amount of flax fibers from the flax that you grow. Now, the flax fibers actually aren't affected by the effect of cold or heat as long as the plants themselves don't die out entirely. So, even if you get less grain, which is kind of junk grain, then don't worry, you'll still get plenty of fibers. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to actually move the potassium crops over to here, and I think I'm going to merge these two here into basically one set just because I want to get a little bit of extra flax going, and I figured it's an opportune time to do that. So we're going to move the flax to here, and also over here. There we go. Now, we need to move the nitrogen crops from here over to here, and we're going to start with the cabbage. Now, the cabbage will take the longest to grow. But that's okay. We're going to do three, four, five, six, all six of those. And then the rest of it's going to be spelt, because the rye didn't do so well. So we're going to do the spelt instead. We could probably plant the rye either very early in spring, or perhaps kind of late in the fall. Maybe mid-fall, like mid-September is probably the latest you want to go. Now over here, we're going to plant our phosphorus crops. That is the pea, and we're going to start with the onions. And we're also going to end with the onions, because that's all we have right now. And there we go. We have four unused plots. That's okay. Now, while other crops are growing, the nutrients that are not being used will continue to recover, albeit at a somewhat slower rate. I think it's... it might be 50%. But Tyron did sort of change up how that works or how long the crops grow for. 
which means that we should be able to keep rotating without having an extra fallow field. You used to have to have basically four fields, and sometimes even five fields, where you'd plant three of them, and you'd leave the other one or two fallow to get the accelerated recovery of not having anything growing in them. But that is not the case anymore. Anyway, we'll come back in probably about another, oh, 16 to 18 days, and we should have some more crops. I'm going to get inside and put some things away, and then we're going to get on to the real meat of the episode. <laughs> Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I can't do it. <laughs> anyway, we will get on to the meat of the episode, and I am excited for it, because today we are moving into the Copper Age, and it's going to be sort of a two-episode, two-step process, because there's kind of the early Copper Age, where you're just trying to get enough copper to bootstrap yourself into more copper. And then in the next episode, we will really get into the Copper Age for real, because there's some setup we need to do this episode to sort of carry us into the next episode and beyond. And once we're solidly in the Copper Age, it's kind of much smoother sailing. So I'm going to get to work, and I'll see you all in the morning. All right, everyone, we are back on this medium rift morning. I'm just cleaning up the riffraff from what spawned last night. Getting a few more flax fibers. It's a bit inefficient, but in the early game, these guys actually are a really good source of them, because you'll get eh, probably one in every four or five has a flax fiber. But yeah, we just got, like, what, eight flax fibers? Okay, so five's already had three. But I wanted to show you what I got from panning last night. I panned just those four blocks of bony soil we got from the ruin downstairs. And we got two lore books. We got a dark gray and a cherry red. We got a rusty gear, a bony ribcage, some bones, and some flint arrowheads along with the flax fibers. I've also been putting our flax fibers together into twine because there's no other use for the fibers other than making twine. So. As soon as you get them, you may as well make twine if you have enough to stack and make it worthwhile, just to help clean up the inventory a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and read these books. I'm not going to read them out loud. I will pop them up on screen, so if you want to read them yourself, you can. And at some point in the future, once we have a decent collection of these, we'll have a dedicated sit down and read with Kurzar episode or two. So we got Confession, part one of one. Let's see there's Confession, so go ahead and read that if you'd like. We also got Reflection last time, and I don't think I paged through them, so if you want to pause and read them, here they are. We did re Reflection back in the first season, I believe. And then we got, what's this one again? Yeah. Dimitri's Notes, part one of five. Okay, cool. And that is, here you go. Alright, so let's go ahead and we're going to run out of space, apparently. Alright. Alright, so today, 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 is going to be all about, well, except for what's already passed, going to be all about getting into the first step of the Copper Age. Now, we've kind of already accidentally cheated our way into the Copper Age. We've got a Copper Axe previously, and I actually haven't used it yet, I don't think. Nope, it is still in pristine condition. And we just got this Copper Pickaxe. Now, if you remember a little while ago, we made a pickaxe mold and a hammer mold. And the pickaxe mold is kind of what's really important at the moment, what's pertinent, but we need the hammer mold as well. And, well, we already have one of these now. So, I guess moot point. But we are going to play as if we hadn't just gotten both of these. I'm going to put these over here, actually. And we're going to go out and we're going to get enough copper to add to our 21 here, so we need 19 in order to make both of these. And that's because each of these copper nuggets, each of any nugget, provides five units of that material, in this case copper. And in order to make a hammer or a pickaxe or most but not all items, you will need 100 units. It makes one ingot, so you need then 20 of these. There are a few items that require more, namely the held hammerhead, and the anvil, at least as far as molds go, and there are a few recipes that take two or three ingots outside of that. But what we're going to do is we're going to go around to 
just a couple of these copper veins we found scattered around the landscape, and we're going to pick up the copper nuggets resting on top of them. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking we'll mostly hit these guys over here, because I know there's some wolves hanging out in this area, so we'll skip them for now. Yeah, we'll go up here, and we'll just pick up the copper nuggets from maybe these four here, and maybe even just two. I don't want to overdo it, because we don't need more than 19. So, we got our gear, we still have some decent armor, we have a shield, we've got food, so let's roll. Okay, here we are approaching our copper vein, and cool, we have what, six, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, wow. This could actually give us everything we need. So we need 19. Now, what I'm going to do is, before we pick this up, this set of nuggets here on the ground, these bits, these indicate that there is a very shallow surface vein of copper ore. Now, this is what is affected by the surface ore generation setting in the world settings. So, if you turn it up or down, you'll have different amounts. But note that these ores are only found near the surface, and they're not affected by the deep ore generation. And copper does also generate as a deep ore. We'll get on to what that means later. But for now, since this means that we need to dig down to get more copper, and we don't have a pickaxe yet... I know, I know, we do, but pretend we don't. That means that we need to mark this exactly, roughly in the middle. We'll do here. That way, when we come back, if we, you know, if we're on the icon, but we kind of missed aiming with the icon earlier, then we won't have to dig around too much to find it. But we're going to go ahead and right-click all of these and pick up all of these nuggets here. And we got 19. Wow, I don't believe it. Okay. Well, that was quick. So we are going to head back home now, and we will get more nuggets later, because we're going to come back through here and ransack these deposits with an actual pickaxe very shortly. So I'll see all of you at home when we are ready to smelt us up some copper. All right, folks, we are home, but there has been a slight change of plan, or at least pace. Oh, no. Yes, there is a change of pace, because I did not make a crucible. I could have sworn I did, but I did not. So we're going to have to make a few things here, a few changes to our plans. But also, you'll see that we have a temporal storm coming. And I want to make some changes to our setup, because we didn't get to see Dave last time. Those of you who don't know who Dave is, don't worry about it. You'll see him. You'll get to meet him. It'll be fun. <laughs> With quotes. So, yeah, we're going to go and meet Dave. And we're hopefully going to get some more profit out of this next temporal storm. But first, we need to make a crucible, which is integral to actually being able to do anything with these metals. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to make... We'll do a set of four, why not? And they are made with the clay forming, just like everything else that requires clay. There we go, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to fire these guys. And something I forgot to explain last time we started doing clay forming is that you don't have to just use firewood when doing your clay. In fact, I recommend graduating from that as long as you are somewhere that has peat. Different types of fuel will burn at different rates, and so the hotter it burns, the faster it will actually get your clay done. And peat isn't much faster than firewood, but it's a little faster. And since you can dig it out of the ground, and we have so much of it around, there's, like, no reason not to use peat. So I'm going to get this inside and put these things away, make probably a few more spears, and then we'll probably be about ready to go over and make some modifications to our storm shelter. Okay, here we are, and we're going to seal this up. And you might be wondering why I don't make a door here. And that's because you do a lot of right-clicking, like throwing spears and harvesting. I don't want to accidentally turn in this direction and right-click the door and let all the drippers in. So that's why. <laughs> I don't want to do that. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to poke a hole up here. Oops, not with a spear. That does poke, but not quite what I want. And then we're going to put a couple ladders down like that. 
And we're going to actually put a ring of dirt up here. Like this, so that we can get a bit of a good view while we're up here. And that will keep drifters from being able to climb from that level up to here. Although I think they might not be able to. Yeah, I guess they already can't. But just in order to make sure we don't fall down, we will do this this way. And then we'll start with the granite stone. We'll ring this with granite. And then I guess we will just dig up this grass. And then we'll stone the rest of this. Okay, there we are. That should be good. And as an added bonus, unless we have some very nimble bears. We're probably okay from bears for the most part, as long as we don't get their attention too hard. So, let's go ahead and I'm going to actually make a bit of a tool rack here, because I made an extra spear by accident. And I don't really need quite as many spears. And this actually works out pretty well, because we do need to wait for our crucibles to finish firing. So we're just going to hang out and hopefully harvest up some drifters in the meantime. So I will see all of you when this storm hits. I probably won't record the whole storm unless anything interesting happens, like if I die. You know, like that bear did to us that one time. And then, yeah, I will otherwise see you after the storm and we'll move on with metal making. All right, everyone, we are just a few moments away from the storm starting. Now, again, if you have motion sickness issues, again, avert your eyes, because this is a medium temporal storm, and as you play the game, the maximum strength of them will get stronger and stronger, and that will result in storms that have wonkier graphics effects and more drain on your temporal stability. I don't think it affects the type of drifters that spawn, but I could be wrong. Anyway, it's about to start, so let's get up here. And it's raining, though, so I don't know if we'll get to see Dave or not. But we'll see. Here we go. The storm begins, and you'll notice... Apparently nothing, because it's raining too hard. Oh, there we go. Lightning strike. So, these giant gears pop up and start spinning everywhere. And if you look around far enough, you might see Dave. Now, Dave might not be visible because of the rain. I don't see him. But Dave is a giant mechanical thing that wanders around during these storms. And is that him? Nope, that's just a tree being wobbly. Well, that's a shame. We'll have to wait until a storm that's not raining to see Dave. But, yep. You can see him. Also, if you crank up your view distance to maximum, you can kind of see him glitching out in the distance, but <laughs> that is neither here nor there. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get inside, and we will get killing these drifters, because I don't want my stability to get too low and me to start going crazy and die. And yes, for every drifter you kill, actually, your stability recovers a little bit. The bigger and better the drifters, the more stability you recover. So I'm going to go ahead and get to it. All right, everyone, storm's over. It was actually a pretty short one. They last an average of, I think, five hours, but they can be shorter or longer. And we really got basically like a three-hour storm. Didn't see a single doubleheader drifter. I did, however, get one temporal gear and five flax fibers. The temp gear was from, I think, a corrupt drifter. So not too shabby. And this means I think we can go and actually repair that translocator that we found up here. Now, we won't do that today, but that is a very exciting prospect indeed, so look forward to it. And now we are going to do the dreaded open things up here and run home in the dark, although I think everything is pretty well gone at this point. And I do know that there are no big potholes between here and home. And it looks like our stuff is still cooking, so I'm going to go ahead and rest and we will get back to you when we're ready to continue with our metallurgy here. Oh, and I forgot to do the torches again. Shame on me. 
Okay, everyone, it is morning. Oh, hey, look at that. Our bees have already done some repopulating. That is great. And this one's actually already full of honey. But I think I'll let it wait until we have more of these filled out. Because every skep that has a second skep nearby, within, I think it's nine blocks, we'll then try to populate that second empty skep. So this one can reach up to two, four, six, eight, all the way over to here, possibly, while propagating. But let's get our crucibles out of here. We will only need the one for today, but once you've made four, you're basically good for the rest of the game. So don't make more than, like, three or four, if you can. The crucible, just like the cooking pot, goes in your fire pit, and then you fill it with the items you want to smelt. Now, we're going to keep it simple for today, and you're going to put the copper in. It doesn't matter whether you spread them out, by the way, or whether you put them all into one slot. What matters is how many nuggets you put in here as far as how fast or slow this process takes. Now, when you are doing this, I recommend preheating it with probably four pieces of peat, because the coal, especially in the early game, the charcoal, is kind of time-consuming to make. You gotta chop down trees, turn it into firewood, which means you're breaking all your axes, and then wait 24 hours or so for the charcoal to complete. So by preheating it with peat, you're getting it to about 900 degrees, and then letting the charcoal or whatever else you're using take it the rest of the way. And you do need charcoal, brown coal, black coal, or anthracite, if you're super lucky, in order to smelt copper, because it has a smelt temperature of 1084C, and charcoal has the highest burn temperature at 1300C, but you can do it with as low as brown coal at 1100C. So we're going to go ahead and light this up, and once this gets down to no more extra pieces of peat here, I will throw in probably two to three pieces of charcoal. You can't smelt quite as long on the embers of the fire as you can cook with it. This will start to drop pretty quickly, and once the temperature gets below your smelting temperature, it solidifies fast, so you don't want to let it drop below that. And here we go. It has now lost its peat. We'll do three. I think we should be okay with two, but again, just in case, I'll keep an eye on it and pull it out if it gets too close. Now, there is something that we need to say farewell to once again. I know we kind of already did, but we have to say farewell to asbestos hands and asbestos feet. Because, once again, we made the tongs a couple of episodes ago, and we will require these once again in order to handle the hot, hot crucible. And also, we used to be able to walk on top of these while they were still hot. Same with fires, but, as you can see, we can no longer do that. And the same will be true for these guys. So make sure you don't put these things in your walkways. It used to be really easy. You could just drop these in your hallway and walk over them as you needed to while things were cooling, but that is no longer possible anymore. So we will wait for this to progress along here, and then we'll pick them up with our tongs. All right, and here we go. I'm stealing this piece of charcoal because we are that close. And once your crucible and your contents get hot enough for long enough, then you'll get a an orange, yellow, or white hot crucible back. And as long as you have tongs, you can hold it. And then you go over to your molds and just right click. Oh, I guess it is now shift right click. It used to be you could just right click. Maybe that's just ingot molds. There you go. And it will stop you once they're full. You can't accidentally spill your contents out. But now we have to wait. Except that we don't, because we already have a copper pickaxe. So we have the advantage of being able to head out basically right now. And we're going to go and take this copper pickaxe. We're going to leave this thing here on the ground. I said. There we go. And we're going to go and we're going to mine out probably just these four deposits for now. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about what to do with the things that we get out of that, because we don't get the same nuggets that we got out of our first foray by picking up off the surface. With that being said, I will see all of you when we are up at the copper once again. Alright, here we are back where we were earlier today. 
I'm going to go ahead and take down our little pole here, our marker. And you'll see I do already have some church stones. I've been picking up the stones along the way just to kind of get rid of them off the ground. That way I don't, like, think that, hey, maybe that could be some copper over there and go investigate. And that can be a handy strategy for just making sure you're not going over things you've already been to before. So we're going to go ahead and drop a ladder here. And then we're going to go and start mining with our pickaxe. And you'll see that if you're familiar with the other block game, it's comparatively pretty slow. And it doesn't get a whole lot faster. I mean, it gets probably two to two and a half times as fast in the long run once we get to the higher tech tiers. But there we go. We now have our first native copper ore. You'll see it is medium and it is in chert. Now, that's important to note because different qualities of copper ore, or any ore, don't stack. And different quantities of most ores in particular types of stone also don't stack. Some things like quartz, you get the quartz itself and not quartz in a stone. But the ores always come in these extra stones. We're going to go ahead and mine this. And you'll see, one, that there's quartz right here. And you'll see that we get a chunk of native copper. It is worth 20 units, and again, it has the parent material being chert. So this can't go into the crucible. And that's why we got the hammer. And you'll see what we're going to do with that later. But first, let's go ahead and we're going to mine out this surface node here. These surface nodes are often small, but some of them can get quite large. I have seen surface nodes with as many as probably... Oh, 40 or so blocks of copper, or copper ore. So we'll see how many we get from here. Noting that since we are no longer the hunter class that we were in the first season, we won't be losing a certain amount of copper ore. Basically, most ores will drop about 110% of their ore, meaning that you'll get one, and then maybe a 10-ish percent chance of getting a second one. Now, if you're a hunter, you almost never get that second one. However, we are no longer a hunter, so we might get two pieces of ore here and there. And we also may eventually or occasionally get some crystallized chunks, which represent a larger bit of ore in the stone. Okay, so that was apparently all there is. Or is it? Now, once you get to the edges of an ore vein, you want to probably dig one more block out like that, and check your corners, because you might find some more ore. These ores generate in approximate disk shapes, but their shapes will kind of follow the land around them, and also Tyron has added a bit of randomization into how these generate, so even independently of the terrain around them, where even if you're on a flat plane, they may still spawn with parts in that are higher, like this, or lower. And so you do want to make sure you dig around and just check. And since they do spawn in disks, you can typically predict, like if you come across one where you hit like a, a long edge, like we did right down here, then it almost certainly means that there is more ore to be found just at a different elevation. Okay, I think that's about it. We'll check this corner and this one, but I think we're about done here. Okay. So, how many do we get? We got 32. So, 32 times 20, that's, what, 640? So that's basically six ingots or six tools worth of copper we got there. Not too bad. And we only used about one-sixth of our copper pickaxe. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to actually take this ladder with us, because I didn't bring enough sticks. And we're going to just fill this in with a bit of dirt instead. And then I'm going to remove this marker, and we'll just cover this up as if it was never there. There we go, and we're going to remove the marker. I used to mark these in black when they were dead, but your map's loading speed and how it affects your CPU is really dependent on how many markers you have, as well as the size of the map, but the markers are a big deal too. So I have started removing markers rather than saving them for later and noting, like, hey, we've already been here for copper. So we're going to go over here, and we're going to mine out this copper node up here. Ooh, there's one here I didn't find or mark. Well, well, well. Well, well, well. But yes, we're going to go ahead, and we're going to mine out all the copper we found up here, as well as this one. 
Although it is very high rift activity, so I may cut this leg of the journey short, go home and rest, and then come back tomorrow and get the rest of this. Alright, folks, we are back at home. I took a bit of a pit stop to get some more cattails, and when we got home, I found here a dead sow. Now, that means that the bears have respawned, and that's not great. And I did see a bear stand up right over about there. It is a black bear. Oh, there's more. Oh, okay, you're alive. All right. That's fine. Are you alive? Yes, you're alive. Okay. Yeah, the bear, I think, is somewhere over there at the moment. So, this is a little too close to home for comfort. So, not sure what we'll do about that just yet. But I took a spin around here, didn't see the bear close by, so I guess it has wandered off. I'll come back and reharvest this guy, or harvest him in the first place, and then we will get back to work here once I have a bit of food ready to roll. Alright, everyone, well, I cook up a meal. Yes, I did go and actually kill a stray ewe because I figured we needed some protein to help get our hit points back up above, well, we're both 20 now, but only barely. And so, I did that, and while I micromanage our meal here, I'm going to go ahead and we'll talk about what we have here as far as our copper goes. So, we got almost two stacks of medium chunks of copper, and almost one stack of poor copper chunks. And the poor chunks will give us 15 units of copper versus the 20, so three nuggets versus four. Not a huge difference, but it does make these less efficient when considering your limited pickaxe durability. We also got one medium crystallized chunk of native copper and one poor crystallized chunk. These give you basically double what the regular chunks do. I like to keep these and put them on display. They're kind of a curiosity, but if we get a whole bunch of them, then I'll sort of start breaking them down and keep like one of each around. We also got 34 pieces of copper from the surface around the different deposits that we mined. And we also got four stacks of church stone. I actually got a little bit more, but I chucked it in favor of the reeds we were getting. So you will get a really healthy amount of stones when you're out there, and these can be a great source of building materials. Because I believe I showed you in the episode where we built our drifter pit that we could make additional cobblestone slabs with some clay, we can also do that with other types of clay stones, for instance, stairs, like so, or full-on blocks if we want to. So keep that in mind. So now that we are back, though, we have a cold pickaxe head and a cold hammer head. Perfect. These just need sticks for their hafts. You cannot use bone for these, unfortunately. But you will get a hammer and a pickaxe from that. And what we do with these now is that in order to turn these into nuggets, we have to smash them with the hammer. Now that does mean that we're basically doubling up on the durability. For each one of these that we smash, we lose one durability on the hammer. And of course, for each one that we mined, we lost one durability on the pickaxe. So bear in mind, you are going to be going through a lot of hammers, especially in the early game with these lower durability copper hammers, when you are just smashing these. Like this alone will take up mm, about a third of this hammer's total durability once we smash them all. So let's go ahead and do that. And there we go. We have a good number of nuggets. And we're going to get started first by making another hammer and pickaxe head. But then later on, we're going to spend some time in between episodes. I'm going to make a whole bunch of different molds. And I will show you what they all do once I have them in the next episode when they are ready to be used. But there are numerous other tool molds that we have here. Actually, you know what? I changed my mind. I will show you what they are now that we're going to make, and then by next episode, we will have them. So, we're going to need a bunch of things. One, we'll need some ingot molds. These are for making the bars that we can then forge on an anvil. And we will need an anvil mold for that. Now, the anvil is one of the items I said takes more than 100 units of copper. This takes 900, so 9 ingots goes into one anvil. There's also an axe, 
a falx, which is this game's version of a sword. It's basically an inward curved sword. We will have a prospecting pick mold and a shovel mold. And we'll make basically all of these. I'm going to skip the hoe mold because you don't really get anything out of having a hoe out of anything but stone. I may make some lamellae molds. I don't, I don't like lamellae armor, honestly. I think it's kind of a waste of your resources. But I kind of feel like maybe we should tinker and experiment with some of the different armor types this time around, rather than jumping just to the most efficient armors. So I may make some of these and see where it goes from there. I may also make some nails and strips molds, but I don't want to use them until we get our anvil. This is from a mod that lets you get around one of the kind of annoying new bits in 1.18 that I don't really appreciate a whole lot. So, with that, that is about it for this episode. I hope you found this to be a useful introduction to the Copper Age and how to just bootstrap yourself and get some more copper. Next episode, we're going to have to expand our work area here because we don't have enough space for all these molds we're going to need. So we'll do some of that, and then we'll also get around to actually using the area for forging, because we are not yet smiths. We only have cast tools. We have not forged any tools yet. And maybe, if we're lucky, this storm will be over by the time that episode rolls around. As always, my name has been Corazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.